Since 4chan was launched in 2003, it has gained quite the reputation for being one of the most depraved corners of the internet. A few weeks ago I made a video on the most disturbing 4chan posts, and it made sense to follow on from that by covering some unsettling 4chan mysteries, including an unknown photo that may be linked to a well-known disappearance, an anon who found some very concerning items in his recently deceased granddad's bunker, and a user who injected worm blood in an attempt to become a superhuman. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can become a Ko-fi member or a channel member to gain access to uncut videos and other perks, or you can leave me a tip by clicking the thanks under this video. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will cover topics that some might find disturbing, including disappearances and murder. Viewer discretion is advised. You can click the link in the description to become a Kofi member and watch the uncut video, which features a whole extra entry that was too graphic for this cut. This video is sponsored by TesterUp. TesterUp is an easy to use app where you can play games, solve tasks and answer surveys to earn real money. There are a variety of games and tasks to suit everyone and you'll get more than 50 offers as soon as you register. For example, I got many games to test including Travel Town, Monopoly Go and Sunshine Island worth over £1,400. If you enjoy games anyway, you can discover new ones with TesterUp and earn money at the same time. You can earn up to $80 per job and you can get a payout to PayPal within 24 hours after you've earned as little as $70. It's free to register and test the apps and you don't have to buy anything in the app so why not try it out today? You can complete the tasks on your phone, tablet or laptop anywhere at any time so it's flexible and hassle free. Click the link in the description to download Tester Up for free and start earning now. If you've heard about the disappearance of Tara Kaliko, you've probably seen the photo on screen now that many believe is of her and a younger boy who must have been kidnapped by the same person. But there was actually another similar photo shared by an anonymous 4chan user in 2015 that also looks like Tara. Before we get onto that, I'll give a summary of the disappearance for anyone who isn't familiar. At around 9.30am on the 20th of September 1988, 19-year-old Tara left her home in Belen, New Mexico to go on a bike ride, taking the same route along the New Mexico State Road 47 that she took every day. Her mother Patty would sometimes accompany her but had stopped recently after becoming concerned that she had been stalked by a motorist. Patty suggested that Tara take pepper spray since she was now going out alone and there was a potential stalker, but Tara declined, presumably not seeing enough of a risk. She had planned to return home before heading back out to play tennis with her boyfriend at 12.30pm, but she never made it back. Patty went out looking for her and decided to call the police when there was no sign of her on her usual bike route. Several people reported seeing Tara riding her bike and some even saw a light coloured pickup truck following closely behind her, but there have been no confirmed sightings since that day and apart from pieces of her Sony Walkman and a cassette tape, none of her belongings, including her bike, have ever been found. Nine months later, a Polaroid photo was discovered near a convenience store in Port St. Joe, Florida, around a 22-hour drive from where Tara was presumably abducted from. The photo showed a young woman and a boy in a van, bound and with black duct tape over their mouths. The woman who found the photo said it was on the ground in a parking space where a white Toyota cargo van had been parked shortly before the same van as what the woman and boy in the photo appeared to be in. She said the driver was a man in his 30s with a moustache, but he has never been identified. 
The photo must have been taken shortly before it was found, because the particular film that was used was not available until May 1989. When Patty saw the photo, she was convinced it was her daughter, particularly because the woman in the photo had a scar on her leg that was identical to one that Tara had from a car accident. Furthermore, a book can be seen next to the woman in the photo, My Sweet Audrina, which was one of Tara's favourite books. However, the opinions of experts and law enforcement is mixed, and it's impossible to say for sure whether the woman really is Tara. It's possible that Patty was convinced because she was just desperate to have a clue regarding the whereabouts of her daughter. As for the boy in the photo, relatives of Michael Henley, a boy who disappeared around 75 miles away from where Tara went missing in April 1988, initially believed it might be him. He vanished while camping with his family in the Zuni Mountains, however, his remains were found in June 1990, around 7 miles away from the campsite, so it's highly unlikely that the boy in the photo was Michael. So who is the boy, and is the woman Tara, or someone else who was kidnapped and never identified? Were these two individuals in the van that the woman who found the photo saw in the parking space, and did the driver mean to leave the photo? There are so many unanswered questions. Considering the van packed in the space and the van in the photo were presumably the same van, I'd assume the man left the photo by accident. Although there are cases where the perpetrators of a crime will taunt law enforcement or the media by contacting them with evidence or details of their crimes, it seems a bit too risky to leave a photo like this then drive off in the same van the photo was taken in. Why was the photo taken in the first place, though? If not for the purpose of leaving a clue, perhaps for the kidnapper's own enjoyment, or maybe it was even intended to be used in a ransom note, but then they chickened out after it was found and broadcast on national TV alongside the woman's description of the van and the man driving it. I remember hearing a theory quite a while ago now that there is actually nothing sinister about this photo at all, that it's not of Tara and it's just two siblings messing around, and maybe one of their parents took the photo as a joke. I wouldn't rule this out, but I doubt it. The photo has been circulated pretty widely, you'd think someone, if not the person who took it or the people in the photo, then someone who knew them would have come forward to explain. In 2009, 20 years after this photo was found, Hot St. Joe police received two letters, one containing a photo of a young boy with a black box drawn over his mouth, as if it were covered by tape, and the other contained an original image of the boy. The boy resembled the boy in the first photo, but has never been conclusively matched. Numerous other photos have surfaced featuring women who resemble Tara, and all but three have been ruled out. The first being the van photo, another was found near a construction site in California, showing a woman's face with tape over her mouth next to light blue striped fabric, like in the pillow that can be seen in the van photo. The other features a woman who is loosely bound, her eyes covered with gauze, and large black framed glasses sat next to a male passenger on an Amtrak train. It's not clear exactly when the photos were taken, but because of the film that was used, the first must have been taken after June 1989, and the second after February 1990. While Patty remained convinced that the woman in the van photo was Tara, she thought the second photo might have been a hoax. In 1998, Tara was officially declared dead, and a judge ruled her death a homicide. The only lead that has been revealed to the public since then was in 2008, when a sheriff in Valencia County reported that he had received information that two teenage boys who knew Tara had accidentally hit her with a truck, and after she died, they hid the body. Although the sheriff knew the names of these boys, he said that without a body, he couldn't make a case. In 2021, a statement revealed that there was a new lead in the case, but no specific details were shared. In 2023, it was announced that there had been a breakthrough, and law enforcement believed that there was sufficient evidence to lead to potential charges, but the identities and specifics of the persons of interest are sealed by the court. 
So as of now, Tara's disappearance and the identities of the people in the photos have not been officially resolved. And that brings us to the 4chan photo. In April 2015, a user shared the van photo on the X board, captioned, What happened to these children, X? One might be Tara Kaliko, but we may never know. Also, the book in the side is actually about rape and brainwashing. No, really. Look it up. The comments were mostly people sharing theories and information about the disappearance, plus many other murders and disappearances, nothing too out of the ordinary, until one anon shared an image labelled helplessrabbit.png. It showed two photos, the first was the original van photo, and the second showed a naked woman, possibly resembling Tara, with black tape over her mouth, rope over her chest, and what appears to be a white sock, with black rope tied around, on her right hand. Of course there is no way to know for sure if this woman is Tara, and as far as I'm aware, law enforcement haven't even publicly acknowledged it, but it does look similar enough to her that it's worth looking into. It looks to have been taken at a similar time, judging by the quality, and it doesn't match the description of the other two photos that weren't ruled out, but also weren't shared publicly. The woman in this photo appears to have shorter hair, but it could have been cut, and it is the same colour. What's interesting is that users reverse image searched at the time and found no matches, and I also tried now and didn't find any other results from before the comment was posted. If this woman isn't Tara, she could still be another victim of kidnapping. Alternatively, and I hope this is the case, she could be an actress for some kind of BDSM content. It doesn't look like Anon just pulled it off some random website, but it is possible that the photo is from an old magazine or something. One user replied with, Never seen that pic of her before, are there any more? I hope she's okay. And there was a reply to that with coordinates that appeared to be in the middle of a lake in Quebec, Canada. I have no idea if these comments are relevant, or it's just someone trolling, and same for the photo, but it doesn't look like they commented again. This is off topic, but further up this thread, when people were discussing other true crime cases, one user left a comment that is its own little mystery. Quote, my mother and I joke about her neighbour being a murderer. Here's some weird stuff about him. He doesn't work from what we know. He has two cars, one of them being an old truck slash SUV with a bullet hole in the window, but the hole looks like it was from the inside going out. The rear seats have been removed as well as the car carpet. There's metal drums in the back that are always in there. The truck also tows a boat. I've never seen him actually drive the truck. He only drives his other car, yet where the truck is parked is always different, like he drives it at night. His other car is an old mid-90s Audi that's really well maintained. To me, that makes me feel like he's really detail-oriented. There's been several times I've seen him pull into his garage with a female in the passenger seat late at night. Pics of the creepy truck if there's interest. Anon did post photos through the windows of the truck and of the bullet holes to back up his story. I really hope there's an innocent explanation to all this, but it is pretty suspicious and probably worth reporting to the police. I wonder how many concerning things people notice in general, anything from hearing a scream coming from a house, to someone they know acting suspiciously, and they don't bother reporting it, assuming everything is fine, and in reality they could have saved someone's life. In August 2012, a 4chan user shared a pretty creepy story on the b-board, with photos to back it up, plus the exact location the photos were taken, in case anyone wanted to go and check it out themselves. Quote, Three days ago, my last living grandparent, my mother's father, passed away at the age of 89. He was a World War II vet, and my mum tells me that after returning home from the Navy, he was never quite the same. In fact, he was pretty paranoid about nearly everything. I was never really allowed to stay at his house. 
1965, his wife died suddenly, with no real explanation. My mother tells me that my grandfather became extremely fearful of a nuclear war with the communists, and that he started to dig a bomb shelter out of the rock and limestone on his land. I had never saw the bomb shelter until today, when the family was going through my grandfather's belongings. I'd only ever asked my grandfather about his hand-dug cave one time in my life, which was when I was about 16 or so when we got together for Christmas. He didn't really seem to want to talk about it. He just told me not to ever go there, because it's just a damned blank. What the word in the blank was, I've never been able to figure out. No amount of googling helped me determine what he said. All I know is it sounded like a sewer. The way he said it was creepy enough that I never asked about it again. I hadn't even thought about the shelter since then until today, when my mother asked me to go and check it out and see if I could find anything worth putting into the estate sale. To be honest, I was pretty excited. I thought maybe I'd find old gas masks, non-perishable food items from the 60s, and maybe even some forms of entertainment that he had planned to use to keep the family busy in the event of an attack. The first thing I found was this rudimentary toilet. Of course, time wasn't kind to it, so there wasn't much left. It had obviously been in disrepair for years. I just snapped a picture of it and kept going, although I did have to admire the work that had to have gone into chipping away at the rock, one heave at a time. But further down the hallway, I came to nothing more than a bunch of old rusted garbage on the floor. I instantly felt my heart sink because I had such high hopes for what this exploration would yield. It was beginning to look like my grandfather had just given up at some point on his dream of crafting a shelter. But you'll notice that, in the previous picture, the hallway curves off to the left. I was expecting to hit a flat wall of rock, but instead I found a huge iron door that was padlocked shut. Fortunately for me, it had become rusted to all hell, so I was actually able to just pick up a decent sized rock off the floor and hit the padlock until it busted the entire loop that it went through. Opening the door was another story though. It was extremely heavy and had become rusted shut over the years. I found a shovel back in the garbage heap and used all my strength to force it open with a lever action. The only thing back here was a hallway that did abruptly end where he had stopped digging, but there was a doorway off to the right. I went through the doorway and inside this room looked more like a cavern than a bomb shelter. As I looked around, I noticed this fucking carving in the stone. At first I thought, oh, no big deal, maybe he just came back here to pray or something. But that's when I started to notice that there were more carvings. Suddenly, I see this face, carved in the rock. There were faces everywhere, seriously. It was as though there were a bunch of ghostly faces staring you down in that room. I noticed that while the previous one appeared to be a soft female face, this one was an angry male face. And there were really quite a few of them. I don't know, probably six or seven. They were all carved into the walls as though they were facing that cross carving, worshipping it or something. I happened to look down at the ground below the skull carving, and there, sitting in a bunch of concrete rubble, was a motherfucking bone. And don't get me wrong, I'm not just a fucking Nancy. This was no deer bone, this was clearly a human bone. My heart was pounding out of my chest. As I started to look more closely, I saw more bones coming out of the concrete, as though human remains had been dumped in a batch of quick dry cement or something. Then, I could have sworn I heard a quiet laugh from the corner of that room, and I bolted. I ran out of that room like the devil was chasing me. I ran all the way out of the shelter, all the way back to the house. And then I saw this one. Unlike every single other carving in this room, which were faces, this one was clearly meant to be a skull. It seemed so out of place, since I felt that the rest of the room had religious connotations to it. Why was there a skull? Well... I found out soon enough. Shit, okay that took a long time to type out and someone just knocked at the door. Keep this thread bumped. Anon was never heard from again after this and the thread was deleted. To be honest, his final comment kinda makes it seem like the post is a hoax, 
It's the typical abrupt ending and leaves people wondering if someone showed up at his house to silence him because he stumbled across something he shouldn't have. But I can believe his story before that. He did post photos of everything, including the bone, and shared a location, and it's not too far-fetched. I think that's where the story ends. He didn't find out why there was a skull, and he just wanted to sensationalise the ending to make it all seem even more mysterious. It was creepy enough already though, so it definitely wasn't necessary. I don't know if his granddad made this bomb shelter in the first place because of his paranoia regarding nuclear war, but considering the human bones that are non found there, perhaps it turned into something much more sinister. I can't really blame Anon for bolting after he saw the bones and heard the laugh, but I kinda wish he stayed and got more photos. Still, at least he made it out alive and definitely didn't get murdered by whoever knocked on his door while he was in the middle of the story. In February 2016, there was a post on the X board titled Empty Towns. It read, Has X ever encountered this phenomenon? Specifically, driving into a town or place, one would expect to find a large amount of humans, only to find none at all. I had this happen a few years ago when I went with my family to Hawthorne, Nevada. It was a Saturday afternoon and the town had a population of 3,000 people, which is small, but surely one would see a single person. We were looking for restrooms. The McDonald's was closed, the stores were closed, the casino was closed, the hotels were closed. We settled on using public restrooms in a park we had found. The women's restroom had shit smeared everywhere, even the doorknob on the other side. It was absolutely disgusting and I'm glad no one touched it. The men's room was a good bit better but still very unclean but we all used it. After we finished we returned to the car. Music started playing from the speakers around town and we gunned it all the way out of town and didn't slow down for 20 miles. There weren't even other cars on the road. It's like the entire town decided to play a prank on us. What the fuck happened? Also, the town is completely surrounded by military bunkers, storehouses and minefields if that helps. Not a soldier in sight. I don't know about anyone else, but I find creepy towns so fascinating. Anywhere that seems just off without a clear explanation. I've never experienced anything too weird, but the best story I have, which isn't much of a story, was when I visited the Sky Lagoon in Iceland. I went with a friend for his birthday for a couple of days and we'd planned to go to the Blue Lagoon as well as other places on a full day tour, but made the stupid decision of drinking the night before and ended up sleeping in and missing the tour. If you've ever been to Reykjavik, you'll be aware of how expensive everything is and we didn't really have the money to spare to rebook the tour so we went with the cheaper option of just visiting the Sky Lagoon instead. So we got a bus to Copavoga, which is the second largest municipality by population, to walk around 20 minutes from the bus stop to the Sky Lagoon. As soon as we got off the bus, there was just a weird vibe about the place. I'm not even sure I could describe it, something just felt off. It was late afternoon and there was almost no one around. Despite it having a population of nearly 40,000 people and being so close to such a popular tourist attraction. With the cost of taxis there and even coaches directly to it, we didn't think we'd be the only people with the idea of getting a bus with a relatively short walk after. There was this really unique looking church in the distance. We were probably being dramatic with this, but it just gave us a bit of an eerie feeling. Like it was a Scientology town or something, which I'm pretty sure it isn't. There was also a strange UFO shaped object on the land across the water from where we were walking. I have no idea what that was. When we got to the Sky Lagoon it was packed, yet we'd only passed maybe three people on the 20 minute walk, which was through what looked to be a main part of the town, then a residential area, and those people gave us this look as if we shouldn't be there. There were bikes and electric scooters parked around, but no one was riding them. 
I've been to various countries that are totally different from England, so it's not like it just wasn't the type of place I'm used to. And aside from it being surprisingly dead, I can't even put my finger on what was so strange about it. If anyone from Iceland is watching this, I definitely don't mean any offence. For what it's worth, this place was still beautiful, as is the country in general. I don't know if we just happened to go at the wrong time, but something just felt really off about it. Anyway, here's a couple more stories on this thread that are much more bizarre than mine. I think I found a fake town last year, like Truman Show fake. Be me, last summer, cross country road trip, hitting up some national parks. In central slash southern Utah. It's getting late, like 10pm, been driving since 6ish. It's dark as fuck, no moon, can only see what's lit up by my headlights. Decide to find some place to rest for the night at the next exit. See a town off in the distance. Turn off on only pull off I've seen for over an hour heading toward town. Pull off is unmarked and unlit, not on car GPS, no cell service. Town is directly ahead though, keep going. Road turns to dirt road and is about 5 miles until it turns to pavement again right at the town where businesses and houses start showing up. Immediately, town strikes me as weird. Nobody is on the streets, no cars on the streets or in the businesses' parking lots. Jazz music is being pumped through the streets for some reason, not loudly but loud enough to hear. This town that looked to be about seven blocks wide from some miles out has every major fast food chain I've heard of and seven hotels on the main street. Still no cell service, still not on car GPS. Go to get food. KFC was fully illuminated and unlocked. Nobody there. Same thing with Jack in the Box. McDonald's has a cashier and cook when I go there. Both look annoyed. Take my order. Give me distinctly non-McDonald's nuggets and fries. Leave. Start going to get a bed for the night. Hampton Inn. Empty parking lot. Third annoyed looking person informs me they're all booked up. Black Winter. The person I'm now convinced was the cook at McDonald's is behind the checking counter. Also empty parking lot, also fully booked. Holiday Inn Express, empty parking lot. Person that was clearly the cashier at McDonald's is behind the checking counter. Surprisingly, they have rooms. Ask him if he's the guy from McDonald's. Uh, no, that's my brother. Fuck it, good enough for me. Get to room, Wi-Fi exists but nothing loads. Shower, crash. Wake up next day, no breakfast in lobby, no other guests. McDonald's guy's still there for checkout. Ask him how to get out of town. Same road you came in on. Head to McDonald's to get something to eat. Town is still playing smooth jazz, still nobody on the street. Order a drive through drive through lady is definitely the lady from the Hampton Inn. Ordered a McGriddle and black coffee. She hands me a microwave English muffin sandwich and what I assume to be some kind of instant coffee. Place is too weird to stay and argue. Heading down the only road in and out of town. Maybe three miles onto the five mile dirt road. Notice big metal wire fence on both sides of the road in the desert. Meet on the road in a big motorized gate that is open. As soon as I pass through, gate starts closing. Get back onto road, finally get onto 62. That's not right. Could have sworn I was on 89 when I decided to pull off and there's mountains in between. Finally get cell service, nothing matches description of town, none of the charges ever show up on my card. First year of college, went to local community college so stayed in hometown. Bored as usual. Driving around killing time with three friends. See road and think, I've never been that way before. None of my friends had either. Head that way, probably 11pm so dark out. Eventually come to a town. There are a lot of small farming communities around here but we hadn't heard of this one. Muncie is the name, population 1100. First thought is, that's a lot of people for me to have never heard of it and be less than 20 miles from hometown of 2100. 
Roll into town. First thing is a cemetery, then a large, very beautiful church. Past police and fire station, same building, then a public basketball court. We get to a four-way intersection, which seems to be the middle of town, and just stop to talk about how this town could have possibly been unknown to us. Three of the four of us have lived in the area our entire lives, and the fourth had been there almost ten years. At this point, we notice there are no lights on, anywhere, even street lights were off. Then we notice we haven't seen a car, either on the road or parked in the town. It was like the town was evacuated. Not one house had a light on or a car outside. On the main road, we passed 40 to 50-ish houses and could see down the side roads because the moon was fairly bright that night. Not one single person. Leave the town, vow to come back the next day. Next day we go back and our jaws drop. Cars everywhere, almost every driveway had one. Probably 20 kids playing basketball, turns out there were multiple courts. People are mowing lawns, there are city workers painting the curbs, women jogging, we couldn't believe our eyes. There was more happening there than there was in our hometown. Why have I not heard of Muncie before? Ask other friends, none of them had heard of it. Never went back. Something about it creeped me out, even when there were people there. Something I wanted to mention but couldn't because of the character limit, sporting events. The town had a school and football field. Our town had 2,100 people, and we were in the same conference as every school in the area with less than 5,000 in their town. We played schools that are farther away, and even in the same direction. One town, Homer, was about 35 miles away from my town in the same direction, so Muncie would have been between us and Homer. For them to have a football team and us not know about it is ridiculous. The only possible way that works is if they only scrimmage themselves and never actually play a game. I live in Wainwright AB and sometime in July in 2012, I woke up around noon and my roomie wasn't there. This wasn't the weirdest thing because he played soccer lots. I got on my bike and was going to 7-Eleven, which is 24 hours, and didn't see anyone at all. I found this a little weird, but just dismissed it. Then I got to 7-Eleven, the doors were unlocked, but literally no one was there. I went to the counter to buy some smokes and rang the bell, but no one came. I just grabbed a pack and walked out the store. Now I was getting a little freaked, there was literally no one anywhere. I went to my buddy's house and his door was unlocked, so I went to his room and he was nowhere in the house. I decided to ask his neighbours, but none of them were home either. I was really worried at this point, so I went home. I tried calling the operator and Walmart, but no one was answering. I tried googling stuff, but apparently our internet was down. I figured I was dreaming at this point and decided to make myself wake up. I grabbed some sleeping pills out of the cabinet and sat on the couch and fell asleep. Then, I woke up on the couch and dismissed it as a dream. An hour later, my roomie came home and asked if I had any cigs. I said no, figuring the 7-Eleven trip was a dream. I told him I was going to 7-Eleven to pick some up, and when I put on my jacket, I found the cigs in my pocket. Still don't understand to this day. There was a different thread around a month ago, also about empty towns. Quote, I can't shake this feeling that something is seriously off about the world population numbers and about how empty our world actually is. Are we being lied to on this? Every other day I feel like I hear about overpopulation and how it's a big issue due to not being able to feed people, climate issues, etc. But then you start looking, and reality is totally different from what we're told. I live in Southern Europe, and most urban areas feel empty. Buildings that seem more like props than places where people actually live. I've started to notice how you barely see any activity outside a few population centres that are scattered around. I swear, half the houses in my neighbourhood might as well be cardboard cutouts for all the activity I see around them. And if I go a bit further away from the main cities and population centres, it's over. 
There's this pervasive emptiness everywhere, and it's just countryside for kilometers and kilometers. In my country, you can go hours without seeing anyone if you just drive even 20 to 30 minutes in areas away from the big cities. This past summer, I passed by little towns in the countrysides, and you see like one or two older folk, and that's it. Besides main western cities, India and China, the world feels desolate and empty. There's so much good, empty terrain. Not being able to feed people is bullshit. Climate change is bullshit. First and foremost, I don't agree with Anun's conclusion that we're being lied to about overpopulation. It's not that there isn't enough space for everyone, but more a lack of resources. Or rather a problem with the distribution of resources. Anyway, it did get me thinking about how it is a little eerie that even in densely populated cities, there are so many abandoned and unused buildings, side streets that are totally dead. Also, how you can visit some cities at night and the centre is absolutely packed, then all of a sudden it's dead. Everyone's disappeared in what feels like a matter of a few minutes. I'm not insinuating there's any conspiracy or anything else at play here, but it just gives me a weird feeling when I see it. There are actually various fake towns in the world. For example, Astra Zero in Sweden, where no one lives or has any reason to visit, but there are fake storefronts like salons and video stores. It was built by Volvo as a place to test the sensors of their prototypes, and storefronts are just wallpapers pasted onto buildings to make it look like an actual street. Another example is Fort Irwin, a national training center in the Mojave Desert in California that was built to resemble conflict zones, consisting of 15 villages that are replicas of Afghan and Iraqi villages. There are hundreds of Arabic-speaking actors here who play the roles of police and civilians. Soldiers are sent here for training before being sent to the real locations. There are plenty of towns and cities around the world that have fake aspects on a much smaller scale. For example, the council trying to make it look like the place is more lively than it is, probably to encourage people to visit or move there. There are even places that will pay you to migrate there, under certain conditions, because the younger generation have all moved to bigger cities and they have an aging population that is soon going to experience big problems if there's no doctors, electricians, plumbers, shop assistants, and other workers of any kind that are necessary to keep a town running. It's quite sad really to think that many of these places were once thriving and now they're almost ghost towns. Just about everyone has heard of the 4chan user who injected glowing liquid into his veins. It was in December 2012, he posted a photo of a bottle containing some kind of liquid and a syringe next to it, filled with glowing blue liquid that looks like a glow stick. He captioned it, 37 decides where this is injected, no limits. People were immediately sceptical, but he provided an image of the syringe with a handwritten timestamp to prove he was serious. Anyway, the 37th comment suggested he inject it into his wrist, so he posted a photo of him doing just that, and you could see his vein glowing blue underneath the skin. After this photo, he was never heard from again. Now if he actually did this, it'd be fair to assume he died, a pretty horrible death at that, but there's a good chance this was a hoax. It's hard to tell for sure, but it doesn't look like the needle has actually gone into his wrist, and I'm not sure if it would actually make his veins light up like that anyway. Anyway, after I remembered this post, I got down a bit of a rabbit hole of anons ejecting stupid things into themselves and came across this post about someone injecting worm blood to basically turn himself into a superhuman. I'll preface this by saying there's a decent chance this post is also a hoax, but I felt it was a pretty amusing one to end on, to lighten the mood a bit, and technically it still counts as a mystery, because like the glow stick anon, this anon also vanished after posting. I apologise for the quality of the screenshots, I found this on Reddit and don't really have the desire to scour the dark depths of 4chan to find the original, but I'll read the post and comments now. 
I will be taking the blood of the common earthworm, reconstituting it and replacing the Fe in the heme group with a Cr ion to increase oxygen affinity. I will then inject the reconstituted worm blood into myself and measure VO2 max. Theoretically, the blood should be a bright aqua colour while deoxygenated and a deep indigo while oxygenated. Comment. When you're going to cut your arms and put worms or some shit in them and then stitch it up, what happened last time? Increasing my blood carrying capacity 3 to 5 times higher than even theoretically possible for regular haemoglobin based blood absolutely would make me superhuman. And because chromium ions are more electronegative than Fe ions, I should be able to get more oxygen out of the air with a breath. A regular person would take up 25% of inhaled oxygen, I would take up close to 100% of it. Comment OP, you're mentally unstable and this website wishes to take advantage of this fact for entertainment. Please take your meds. I am a visionary. I will literally put an end to the illusion we all bleed red. I will be a blue blood. I will be better than human. With this modification alone, my blood oxygen carrying capacity with 3 to 5 times, and my blood will more rapidly take up oxygen, I will also become immune to carbon monoxide poisoning. Chromium isn't a heavy metal, nor is it toxic, not in this ionization state anyway. The chromium won't dissociate with the protein, and studies have shown mammals can remove earthworm blood without issue. Toxicity won't be a factor. Comment. How does the process work? Do you just inject yourself with the altered worm blood? Basically, yes. I need to extract 3 kilograms, then substitute their iron with chromium, which is actually pretty simple. Then I mix with saline and do a full blood transfusion. This will give me the equivalent of 60% heme levels, which is basically blood dopa level. Multiplied by the volumetric efficiency increase, I should increase my blood oxygen carrying capacity by 450%. That's actually the next step, giving myself a genetically engineered peripheral stem cell transplant that I engineered with worm DNA and replaced the iron with the chromium, and I'd basically permanently enhance my blood, then I'd just need to keep taking a few micrograms of chromium chloride as a supplement, because 2 plus chromium doesn't exist in food. Apologies if I messed up a couple of words in there, it is a little bit hard to read. As I said, I'd be surprised if this wasn't a hoax, but I also don't think you can put anything past 4chan users. Some people are prepared to risk their lives on the off chance that their crazy hypothesis works. I've seen worse things with actual proof before, so you never know. Interestingly, while injecting yourself is incredibly stupid and dangerous, there might have been some truth to his logic. A few years ago, Frank Zal, a French biology researcher, invented a treatment that involved injecting sandworm blood directly into human blood. Years prior, he observed that sandworms could survive on land and in water, and that they only breathe when they're in the sea, then they stop breathing for 6 hours when in the sand. He wondered if their ability to hold their breath for such a long time could lead to a treatment that would improve hypoxemia. In 2020, this treatment was approved for stage 1 clinical trials on COVID patients in two hospitals in France. The following year, a research paper was published indicating that the treatment might be useful, but that further investigation was needed to establish the safety and efficacy. So maybe Anon isn't as crazy as he initially seems, but I still would not recommend trying this for yourself. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments, as well as any other 4chan mysteries you'd like me to cover in the future. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my Kofi members and channel members whose names are on screen now, I really appreciate your support. Remember to click the link in the description to download Tester Up for free and start earning now.
Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time in a new video.